Hi, I'm Dale from Glenali Pipes. Um, today I'm doing this video on moisture control devices. Now, I did a previous video on moisture, the bad moisture, and, and the moisture going through the system, and the number of um, questions I've had sent to me, uh, clearly there's, there's misinformation and confusion out there. So today I thought I'd do it with, the, specifically with devices um, in mind. And another question I was asked about, um, do these affect sound? So I'm going to address that as well. Now the devices I'm using, this is a typical canister system. It has a canister filled up with um, absorbent media um, material. This particular one is filled up with kitty litter or clay. We call it kitty litter, to, generically kitty litter, but it's an absorbent clay, like oil dry you'd use in a workshop or police use on the road and stuff like that. As one tube for each drone read, drone stock, and one goes off to your time to stop. This particular one has these little um, screw fittings and a little rubber expanding rubber washer. So you put that in the bottom of your drone and you just wind it up and expands the rubber and it will hold it on there. So, um, that basically it, the one. It goes down onto your chart, they've got the same thing, it just doesn't have the fitting there. Now, another type is same sort of deal, it's got a canister full of absorbent material. This one here just has the, th for the three drones, so it's one for each drone. Now, this one has little rubber booties on it, little grommet things, so on this particular one, snap them onto the bottom of your, um, onto your bottom of your stop. Um, the same as the same as the other one, you'll blow the air into the bag, you'll travel through, drill at the back, through the absorbent media, and then through the tube and power up your ring. Now, both of these devices require that you open up the bag, have a zip bag. You, you can't fit them in any other way. Um, another device out there, same sort of deal, a little canister, filled up with, full of absorbent material. Could be either you know clay or, or silica gel. This one's got silica gel in, or sort of chips, silica chips. Um, it doesn't have not the nice little round pellets, but still the same sort of thing. It's still absorbent material. Um, this one here got a little one-way valve arrangement on it, um, similar to this. This one that you hemp it, and you fit it onto each individual stock. So each one will have its own little canister in it. Um, same deal, you blow air into the bag, goes through the perforations, through the absorbent material, and then up through powering your reed. Um, these particular ones, I've got three of these sent to me. Um, I'm thinking there might be a fourth one that goes to your chanter, I'm not too sure. Um, because they're quite firm, they're, well, obviously they're hemped into your stock, it didn't take much leverage before they, all of them have got little splits in them. Well, obviously they've been in the bag they've just had a bit of pressure put on them so if you're using these you'd have to be careful of that but still worked okay still stayed in the bag still held together and everything but had a little cracks now the other type of system is this tube system um, once again still needs a zip bag to get it in there this one fits onto your bottom of your of your blow stock your blow pipe stock and same thing only now all the moisture that you're blowing and all your spit and moisture is captured by this. Now on these systems, it's not. Your blowpipe goes directly into your bag. The air goes directly into your bag and then goes through these. So these don't capture your spit. So you'd have to have an extra device if you wanted to capture all your spit and slide it going in the bag. Whereas these ones will. They have absorbent cloth at the end of it. And that bottle has a couple of holes in it. You have them facing up so the air goes in through your blow stick. Moisture gets absorbed by the material, comes out the holes, and then will go up your drone stock into your reed. But once again, you still need an open bag. This one here is, uh, doesn't need an open bag. Showed you this before, same sort of deal. On your blow stick, it captures all your spit and saliva going into it. This one here has the valve at the end, has a bit of absorbent material there, has a valve at the end. Advantage of this one is you keep it into a sheepy bag, or like a fully enclosed bag, and when it gets full, with your blow stick on it, you don't have a blow stick with a valve at the bottom of it, and you don't have to worry about having a valve in your thing because the valve's at the end, and you can just tip it out in between tunes or performance or whatever, and then at the end of the day you'd pull it out and, and, and change the cloth for a dry cloth. So they're the different devices that have there. Now, 
as I said previously, the breath coming out of your mouth is out of your lungs, saturated. It means it can't absorb any more moisture. It's 100% RH. As I showed you previously, with this one here, if we get a hygrometer and we look at the humidity, today it's about 60%. This canister has been fully dried, but I haven't blown this one yet. Um, it took six cycles of 20 seconds in the microwave before it stopped um, giving off vapour. So it takes a little bit of energy to get the moisture out of it once it's got into it. So, but as you can see with this thing here, that's it, showing at 60, 65, 66. So you can see how quickly it gets up. Now, you can't do anything about that because that's your breath. Why doesn't this take the moisture out of your breath? Because it simply doesn't have the capacity. That such a short distance with such a small amount of media and the airspeed going through it, it's never going to work. We had to make a canister, 50 mil diameter canister, 500 millimetres long, 50 centimetres long, before we started to know some effect. And you can't have a whole lot of those in your bag. But... And even then, it didn't, uh, after about 10 minutes, the air coming through was still 100% saturated, but it did hold it up for a little while. Bottom line is, they just don't have the capacity. They cannot drive. They're not an air dryer. They're passive, they're not like an active air dryer or something. So that's why the air hitting your reed is just as moist as it would be without one of these. So to clear up the confusion, that's it. And it doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter if you're in Singapore or the Sahara. Your lung always expels saturated air. If it doesn't, you're a sick little puppy. Okay. Next thing was the noise, the sound. Now, previously, I haven't. I've heard a lot of people say they can hear the sound difference, and I've always been a little bit skeptical about it because I don't have particularly good hearing, and I've, I don't have a trained ear on the bagpipe. However, I've got software that is exceptionally good at hearing things. Now, to explain something, this is a sine wave. You've seen them at school in science and stuff. So, just like an AC wave and electricity, this is, the sound does the same thing. And the maximum um, amplitude is the top. In other words, the volume is right up the top. Of the curve. Now, this is two sine waves. So this is like having two tenors. Each one's got its own sound wave. Now, <clears throat> those sound waves are not in sync with each other. They're not balanced. They're not in phase with each other. When we get our, our drones up and we balance them, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get them in phase. Now, when the sound's out of phase, you lose volume. Now, people who set up uh, microphones for a band, for example, they would know all about phase. They'd know how important it is. And they'd also know the losses they get through things being out of phase. Um, there's a lot of times we keep things out of phase, like twin engines on a boat, for example. We don't want them in phase with each other because that means that the vibrations will exceed, become excessive. So we keep them separate, so the vibrations, you have two separate vibrations at a low level. If they were in sync, if they were in phase with each other, you'd end up with a much bigger vibration, one much bigger vibration. We do it in data comms, um, aircraft. There's a lot of times that we don't want things um, in phase with each other. Um, fans and, and, and high-rise buildings and such. But there's a lot of examples. However, for the bagpipe, we want them in phase. Because as soon as they get into phase, we get a decibel hit. And this is what the software showed. Now, what was unusual about it was that if we had the tube system on the two drones, now remember we're using exactly the same set of pipes, exactly the same reeds, and we're using a blowing machine. So the blowing machine is extremely accurate. It maintains very, very accurate pressure. So, very accurate control. So, when we have the tubes on it, even when we got them to lock, even when we got them in phase, we didn't get a dB hit on it. 
we didn't get anywhere near the DB hit that we got when we pulled the tubes off. So we have the, the have the tube on, and we can see the we can have a look at the the amplitude on the software. We pull the tubes off, and we lock them, and we can see that we get a bigger hit. Now. I've sort of had my always ever had my doubts about the judges and stuff that believe that they can hear it, but I've changed my mind on that. The software can clearly hear it, can clearly demonstrate that it, that it exists, so you do get a hit out of it. The one-way valves were even worse. When you had the one-way valves, and they were pretty horrible on the software. And I'm not sure how many people can hear it with their ear, but I believe those good pipers can, and I believe those good judges can, despite anything I may have said in the past. So, how does it work? Now, there were, I'm not an authority on sound, on acoustics, but after doing some reading and after speaking to some people, we, this is one of the references I use, and this is Bernard. He's got, it's not heavy reading, and he, he covers the phenomena of sound and in instruments, and why certain things happen with instruments. And like I said, it's not heavy reading. If you're interested, that's one thing you can read. The other one that I found extremely useful was this one, there's air columns and tone holes, by this one by um, Hopkin. Now that was also a very useful um, reading and it explained a lot of things. The trouble is I don't have um, a, I don't have a degree in engineering degree in acoustics or anything. So I don't have a, the understanding to fully understand what they're saying. But some things were quite clear and the analogy that was explained to me was with um, um, a sax blower or a clarinet blower. Now they can play with an open throat or a closed throat. When they play with an open throat, they get a bigger, fatter sound. And you can speak to anyone, they'll tell you the same thing. And it's a technique. If they play with a closed throat, and a lot of players do play closed throat, they end up with a thinner, weaker sound. And it's just a fact. And, and once again, the software shows it. The, so the software doesn't lie. After reading the, those books, especially Bernard's book, what he talks about, what he explains, is that when a sound wave is travelling up and down a device like your drone, it spills out the ends. It's called end correction. Now, the way I understand it is that it's like the, the saxophone of deep throat. The bag is effectively like that capacity down the throat to the lung that the sax player is using the bag is that volume when you have a tube on the bottom of it you stop that sound wave traveling into the bag you also stop that sound wave from this one mixing with the sound wave from the one next to it and that's why when we joined when we had the tubes on the bottom even though we thought we'd locked them according to the tuner in our ear we thought they were locked we didn't get the db hit now Pipers, there's some pipers out there will, will tell you that sometimes they play their pipe and they just seem to really just blow them off the park. Just really got a really big sound for some reason, big vibrating sound out of their bag. Well, we believe that that's what's happening now, was that they've managed to get their drones and their chanter in phase. And that's where they're getting that hit, that decibel hit, that volume hit, that... that that bigger fatter sound from now going one step further when you look at some of the, the the top bands they'll have professional read people working for them now these are these guys are very very good and they're dealing with extremely good pipers so they're dealing with some of the best pipers in the world so these guys are that steady now we used a blowing machine to get it steady but those really good pipers, they're highly skilled pipers, and they've got the skill to maintain that pressure. So they get their reed guy, or maybe they can do it themselves, and when they can get their instruments all in sync with each other on the one bag, that's where they get that sound. And you've heard it sometimes with pipers, I, I, I know I have. And I think, well, it just really, really just rocks you. Just, just, it just does it for you. Now, go one step further. If you've got one piper, and he's got all his reeds in phase with each other, and he's got a good enough control to maintain that, he's going to get a bigger sound than the piper next to him who doesn't have things perfectly in phase. 
Now, go one step further. Imagine if you had 10 pipers in a band and their reed guy had set them all up so that they all had exactly the same, or as near as you can get, lock. But now, not only have you got the piper with all of his devices locked, you've now also got the pipes locked with each other. So now you've got an individual pipe with an extra big sound, and now because he's locking with the pipers around him, he's also getting a bigger sound. The band is getting a bigger sound, and I think that's what you can hear with some of these top bands. Sometimes you think, wow, they're just blowing everyone off the park. They're just, they're just a cut above everyone else, and I believe that's what's happening. You would have to have extremely skilled pipers to be able to do that, and you would have to have extremely skilled read people to do that, but I believe now it's possible, based on the software, based on what we see, I believe it's possible. So, to summarise out of all of this with these, do these kill sound? Yes, and you can see it on the software, it's very, very easy. Whether you can hear it with your ear, I'm not too sure. Now, it's just the way it is, but I believe, based on what I've heard from some judges and some top pipers, I believe that, that yes, that people can hear it, people do hear it. They don't dry your reed out. They don't keep your reed dry, and they shouldn't keep your reed dry. If you're using cane reeds, you do not want your reeds to be dry anyway. So your, your saturated breath will, will keep them up to the correct moisture content. If you're using synthetic reeds, then I'm not too sure why you'd even want one of these. But there was an advantage to using these. What we noticed when we were dropping on and off, on and off to do the audio testing, we noticed that with the tubes on, we never got any roaring drones, any roaring reeds at all. When we drop these off, and we quite often, a couple of the pipers particularly, ended up having to bang it a couple of times because they ended up with roaring drones. They had to restart a couple of times. It never happened with these on it, with the tubes on it, but it did happen without the tubes. What we found was the resistance of the air going through this canister was enough to stop the big inrush of air on the reed. So the reed couldn't, it didn't have that big thump of air so it could overspeed. So it stayed at a moderate speed, never roared at all. So if you've got real problems with your band, with roaring drones, or they just don't have the striking control, that will help, but you'll sacrifice sound for it. The one-way valves, now they were, they were a step further. Some of them worked very poorly just because of the way that they were engineered and you know the bottom line, well, I, if, if you feel that you've got to have one-way valves for your strike-ins and your stops, I'd spend the money on a good tutor and I'd learn good technique because then you'll have that technique forever. These valves, they can go out of adjustment, they come and go, they can fail and really if you're if your technique is that poor that you'd need these, um, I would do something about your technique. But that's just my personal view. Anyway, I hope I've answered some of the questions. Um, once again, read the material that I highlighted. I found it very, very interesting. Um, although I don't have enough of an understanding of the field to, to fully understand what they're saying, but it, it, there was enough of an understanding to realise that there was a reason for the sound benefit we get with and without the tubes. So there was enough explanation there to, to, to establish that yes, it does happen, and that's what we're hearing. Okay, hope that answers the question. Thanks for watching.